Please welcome Jennifer Camper. Wow. Well, thank you all for coming here. Um, I know it's a beautiful day out, and you all have pool parties and barbecues to go to, so I really appreciate you coming out here. Um, when we draw cartoons, we work on them a long time, and then we send them out into the world, and we never hear from them again often. So this is a wonderful chance for us as cartoonists to get to meet our reading audience and hear your feedback. So this is a really good thing for us as well as for you. Um, I'm just going to start with the slideshow and then introduce to you a couple of the cartoonists who are in the anthology, and we'll talk about comics. But first, let's do the slideshow. Here's an excerpt from Leanne Franson's cartoon, and I just want to talk about how with comics you get words and pictures, and the two of them together sometimes add up to more than each separately. Oh, now he'd love me for sure. But then, and see that little bag? That's the chicken head that she's bringing to her prospective boyfriend as a token of love. <laughs> but one of the things that we cartoonists really love about cartooning is that you can tell, tell stories with words and pictures. And I guess most of us can't decide which to use, so we end up using both. And that's probably why we became cartoonists. And cartoons have their own vocabulary. And I think it's really amazing that we all understand it, but how did we learn it? I mean, we understand the difference between a thought balloon and a word balloon. And in this panel by uh, Serena Pillai, we understand anger and sound effects in this panel by Diane DeMassa. And motion in this panel by Robert Tripto. And I was talking to Robert, and this cartoon was based on a real wedding, and the two guys actually did try and run at each other in slow motion, and this actually happened, and they both fell on the ground. <laughs> and, and music. I mean, here we have just words and, and pictures, and you know that there's music in the background of this panel by Alison Bechtel. Quit whining, Mo. It won't be so bad. That couple of babes looks like they're headed this way. Yeah, and so does a psycho punk behind him and the guy with the cape. How did I let you talk me into this? I hate parties. This issue of Juicy Mother also has a reinterpretation of Shakespeare's sonnet by Michael Fahey. Against my love shall be as I am now, with time's injurious hand, crushed and overworn. When hours have drained his blood and filled his brow with lines and wrinkles. When his youthful morn hath traveled on to age's sleepy night. And you just know this is the kind of guy that Shakespeare was thinking of when he wrote it. We also have paper dolls in Juicy Mother. This is from Robert Tripto's cartoon. And these are the two gentlemen getting married trying to decide what to wear. I know, let's go as paper dolls. Spare us the corny gimmicks. Hip hop, goth. Liberace wear, Elton John. Also, I love cartoon because you can always throw extra things in the background. This is a detail from a panel by Joan Hilty, and check out the headline on the newspaper. Another thing that's in Juicy Mother is comics about cartooning. And this is from Alison Bechdel's cartoon. I wasn't always an oppressed minority cartoonist. As a child, I drew whatever the hell I felt like. But once I realized I was an oppressed minority, those days were gone. From that point on, all I drew was cartoons about my oppressed minority group. Actually, for a long time, this was not a problem. So that's just a little taste of what's in Juicy Mother. And that's the end of the slideshow.
I don't show up unless I get vodka. Um, Cheers. I want to introduce, I would like to introduce two of the contributors to Juicy Mother, um, starting at that end, if I can talk and read at the same time. Howard Cruz. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Howard Cruz was the founding editor in 1980 of Gay Comics and is the creator of the comic strip Wendell. Among Howard's many books is the award-winning graphic novel Stuck Rubber Baby, which has been translated into German, Italian, French, and Spanish. Any other languages coming along? Dutch is on the way. Oh, Dutch is on the way. Howard's newest book is an, an illustrated fable created with Jean E. Schaefer, and it's called The Swimmer with a Rope in His Teeth. And in the comics world, Howard is known as the godfather of gay comics. So we're really happy to have him here. And Joan Hilty is the creator of the comic strip Bitter Girl, distributed by the Q Syndicate, which follows the romantic adventures of a bunch of big city dykes and runs weekly at planetout.com. Weekly? Weekly. Weekly. Her work has appeared in The Village Voice, The Advocate, and Girl Jock Magazine, among many, many others. And by day, she works for the man as an editor at DC Comics. So I'm really glad to have both of them here with me. And I want to just start out with a couple of questions, and then later we'll, we'll do whatever you guys want to answer, questions or whatever. Um, I have a question for both of you, though, is what... What kinds of art and drawing and comics and writing did you do when you were little? <laughs> Tons. Uh, from a very early age, I drew on whatever flat surface I could get my hands on. Um, my father was a pediatrician. When I went and visited him at the office, the only way to keep me from destroying anything was to give me some scratch paper to draw on the back of. Um, it would be figures. It would sometimes, oddly enough, be a single word with little figures crawling all over it. I don't know what that was about. I haven't gotten to that point in therapy yet. Um, later on, um, I just started drawing my own comics that were sort of one panel of action per eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. It was very easy to keep me occupied for a long time. I would construct whole newspapers and monologues to put up in the bathroom in my family house so that you could read while you were on the toilet. And um, that sort of naturally gravitated into drawing my way through uh, high school and college and going on to indie comics where I was fortunate enough to meet these guys afterwards. Uh, the first comic book I was ever aware of was Little Lulu Comics, which was a... Uh, in its prime, uh, at just the right time for me to discover it, uh, when I was around six. And, uh, I, uh, somehow had learned that I liked drawing pictures and could draw pictures, and I just became obsessive about spending a lot of my time drawing. Also, uh, I played with, uh, puppets a lot and made up stories with my puppets, and I later realized these two are very much. You still have those puppets? Uh, those very puppets, no, they, they totally wore out. They got a lot of, uh, mileage. But I would, anytime, um, we, our family went to see a movie, I would come home and then reenact the movie with my puppets as a sort of repertory company of characters. And, um, that was, that was good practice for making up stories, actually. And, uh, meanwhile, I would just imitate one comic strip after another from the newspapers, uh, mainly newspaper strips. Um, and so I went through my Pogo phase and my little Abner phase and my uh, uh, Barnaby phase. Most people haven't even heard of Barnaby, but it was really one of the great comics of all time. And uh, also I was a big uh, Dr. Seuss enthusiast, and I wrote him a fan letter when I was a kid telling him I wanted to grow up and draw picture books like uh, he did, and uh, he wrote me back a very gracious gracious letter that was not condescending at all and was encouraging and told me to be myself and don't try to imitate anyone else. So when he had his uh, big celebration of his 80th birthday, I, that was just when my first book, Wendell, came out. And so I wrote him a letter and said, although I didn't go into children's books, I, I did become a cartoonist and my first book is just coming out. And he wrote me back again and he said, um, you know, I'd sent him a photocopy of our earlier exchange, and uh, he wrote back, and uh, once again was very gracious. He, he he will always be a very special creator uh, for me. But then I got into underground comics, and uh, that uh, started me toward 
following a different path from the mainstream. Um, Howard was the first editor of Gay Comics, which came out in 1980? Right. We sent out the letters inviting contributors in 79, and the first issue came out in 80. So I wonder if you could talk about this was the first gay cartoon book, I think, in the United States. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how did you decide to do it and responses that you got. Well, not quite the first. The, uh, or Meat Men. Well, no, that, this was way before Meat Men. Uh, there was uh, Mary Wings and uh, Roberta Gregory had both put out lesbian comics, Dynamite Damsels had come out comics. Uh, right, Lee Mars, although she... She sort of self-identified. I mean, her characters sort of went back and forth. See, they were flower. She had a flower child character, uh, Pudge, who had sex uh, pretty much uh, on impulse with anybody. Uh, a really wonderful character. And incidentally, I just saw on her website that at long last there's going to be a book collection of the three of the Pudge Girl Blimp series. So, so that's great. But, uh, but anyway, there was a. Uh, uh, those two were by lesbians, and, and those were real mo- role models for me. But also there was a male anthology series called Gay Heartthrobs, uh, which was kind of, um, it, it was a groundbreaking. It was the first gay male anthology underground comic book. Uh, but it was kind of a negative example in many ways because it was campy and silly and uh, sort of self-consciously outrageous. And uh, when Dennis Kitchen, uh, the publisher of Kitchens and Comics, said, uh, would you like to edit a new series to be called Gay Comics, I felt like this was a chance to have gay comics that reflected the life that actual gay people that I knew were living and not uh, not just stereotypes. And so that's how it got started. And, and as you may remember, we just sort of put out the word that we were looking for contributors because we didn't know who was gay. And... Uh, to my surprise, we, we we got a a nice set of people from the beginning, among whom was uh, Jennifer Camper, who had a wonderful thing about a truck driving truck driving woman, and uh, and then uh, bit by bit, a whole new generation of uh, gay and lesbian cartoonists started coming out of the woodwork, and um, it, it was wonderful. By the end of the '80s, when we did a show at the Gay Center in New York, uh, there were. A, a, a huge number of people that I'd never even heard of, gay cartoonists from small papers all over the country. So it really flowered during during that generation. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about the reactions you've had to your cartoons. And Joan, I think you've had um, some really interesting ones, particularly your Winona Judd cartoon. I thought maybe you could talk about that. That, that's such an inter- interesting uh, reaction that it kind of eclipses any other reaction I've, I've ever had. I, uh, for a period in the early 90s, um, I drew a back page cartoon for The Advocate, um, a spot that has on and off been dedicated to cartoons, and that, in fact, uh, was somewhere where Wendell uh, Howard Strip ran for a very long time. Uh, one of the first cartoons... It wasn't one of the first, but but uh, uh, one of the cartoons I did for them was called I Was a Celebrity Plaything. It was a tongue-in-cheek six-panel strip that uh, detailed everything that happened to me after I broke up with Gabriella Sabatini and ran into the arms of Ellen Barkin to console myself and... A series of misfortunes ensues where I wind up uh, waking up from another unfortunate one-night stand to have Winona Judd waiting there for me to carry me away on her motorcycle. It's satire. It's fiction. That should be obvious. Uh, I sent it in to my editor. I said, do you think there's any legal problem with this? I mean, it's obviously satire. He said, no, no, no problem at all. Uh, a few weeks after it's published, he calls and says, okay, National Enquirer reporter, I don't want you to panic. <laughs> that's when you panic. A National Enquirer reporter has been calling our editorial offices wanting to speak to you. He won't say what it's about, but we need you to call him back because he's been calling here every damn day. So I panicked, and I called this guy, and he said it's about the strip where you talk about Winona Judd, who of all the the women named in that strip was the biggest celebrity at that time. And uh, I said, well, he said, are you are you trying to out her as a 
lesbian. And what, of course, happened was the early 90s, you know, the, the tabloids were monitoring gay publications to see who they could get outed next. You know, this seemed interesting. And I said, the strip is satire. I said, I'm not implying that any of the women in there are, are, are gay. I never meant to uh, imply anything by it. It's just my own sort of fun little fantasy. We had a normal conversation. At the end of it, I said, you're not going to actually, you know, run anything, are you? And he was a little vague. He said, yeah, well, we have to check out a couple other things, and maybe there'll be a little item. He was very vague. I decided, no problem. I actually went down to L.A. a couple, uh, a month or so later to meet the editors of The Advocate and have lunch, and we all laughed about it when we were down there. They'd never heard back. Everything was fine. That night, uh, my editor calls me at the place I was staying, at a friend's house in L.A., and he said, I don't want you to panic. <laughs> But they did run something. And I went running out into West Hollywood in the middle of the night to the first convenience store I could find, flipped through the first inquiry I got. It was last week, so there was nothing in there. The second convenience store I went to that I found, I picked it up, and on the front page right next to a big photo of Roseanne and Tom Arnold, remember it was 1992, um, there was a big photo of Winona Judd looking pissed. This is on the cover, and it says, Winona, I'm no lesbian. And I looked at it, and I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> And I flipped it open, and I flipped to the back page, and they had written a full-page article complete with a few panels excerpted from my comic and a big photo of Winona Judd and her sort of, like, wildest butch phase on her motorcycle in, in uh, shades in the whole nine yards and uh, uh, saying, talking about the fuss that had been generated around this strip, accusing Winona Judd of being a lesbian. And that's how I learned about the Inquirer's journalistic ethics, because when I spoke to the reporter, he informed me that this had all come about because somebody had given a copy of the cartoon to Naomi Judd, who you may know as Winona's mom and her country music duet partner for a long time, and that Naomi had hit the roof. When the article was printed, it said that uh, Winona was serving food to the poor in Nashville when the offending cartoon was handed to her and promptly burst into tears. I don't think any of these things were true, but they got a whole article out of it, uh, fortunately, that was the end of it. I wrote a nice letter to her agent saying, actually, I'm a fan and didn't mean to offend and blah, blah, blah. They sent, uh, her lawyer sent a couple of letters to the advocate saying, we aren't happy, but we can't sue you, but we're, we aren't happy, but we can't sue you, but we aren't happy. <laughs> and that was, that was the end of my, uh, 15 minutes of fame. That was, that was, that was a lot of fun. That's so cool. I've never made the Inquirer. <laughs> Just the once. Winona should be honored. That's all I could say. Um, so that's the power of cartooning. Uh, Howard did a long-running strip in The Advocate called Wendell. And, Howard, I wondered if you could talk about how you decided to do that strip and, um, I don't know, just what you generally about that comic because it was... Really, the first, you know, story a, a long-running story about a gay character with a whole community of gay characters. First, I want to say I'm so impressed. My college didn't have its own brand of water. <laughs> Simmons, water. Simmons water. Wow, <laughs> it's tasty. <laughs> nice. Um, the uh, advocate became of, aware of me because, partly because of gay comics, but also because I was doing some comics on gay themes for the Village Voice. And they reprinted one of the strips I did for The Voice, and so as long as they were aware of me, I said, well, how, would, how about if I did a strip for you? Uh, and so they s were open to the idea and suggested I propose a strip. And at first, I proposed a strip uh, featuring these two older uh, gay lovers that were featured in my gay comic story, Dirty Old Lovers. Uh, and uh, then they wrote back and said, well, you know, we sort of like young and hunky, uh, please. So anyway, I uh, just proposed a strip featuring a young, a young gay man. It was originally the idea was it was going to be just a, joke, a strip about, you know, the gay bar scene. Uh, just a joke for a single joke for each strip because they didn't promise they would run it every issue or anything. It was just occasionally. And it was going to run in their... Uh, sex ad section uh, as filler and uh, but after I'd done uh, you know they liked the first one and it, it, they said okay do more and so I would 
I started doing them periodically, and then um, it began to hit me. This was just as the AIDS epidemic was picking up, and uh, basically uh, light humor about cruising the gay bars sort of didn't fit with the times. It was a time of anxiety, uh, and so that old staple of gay humor was um, didn't play well anymore. And so anyway, that's how I, I sort of changed course and introduced a character that uh, Wendell fell in love with. And uh, the strip for a while was about their courtship and then um, ultimately about their long-term relationship. So that ran during much of the 80s. And uh, I was trying to reflect the life that the readers of The Advocate were leading. The idea was that the news events of the day, the 1987 March on Washington, uh, you know, Jesse Helms in the Senate, all of the things that were in the news uh, would be part of the lives of these everyday gay characters. They were the way they were for my friends and me. And uh, so that's kind of how it played out. And isn't it, isn't it true that every sentence in Wendell ends with an exclamation mark? Well, that's an old comic book uh a comic book a convention, which I have finally abandoned, but uh, I was I was just so impressed. I remember reading Wendell for a while, and then Howard said, "Yeah, every every sentence has an exclamation mark at," and I was like, "Really?" And I was like, "How could I not have noticed that?" And if you read it, it's true, and it's I don't know, I love that. Um, anyway, Joan, now you do a cartoon now called Bitter Girl, and you do it weekly, and I wondered if you could talk about what it's like to do a weekly strip. It's hell. <laughs> Jen mentioned to you that I have a day job as an editor, and a big part of that day job is at DC, at DC Comics, so a comic book company. So a large part of that job is yelling at freelancers um, to get their stuff in on time. Pencilers, scripters, inkers, colorists, all day long yelling at people for blowing their deadlines. I go home at night and get yelled at for blowing my deadline. Um, I, I want to uh, also add a little bit of information, since we're talking about Bitter Girl, to what Jen said at the beginning. The strip, uh, unfortunately, uh, no longer runs regularly at Planet Out. There's just the archives there now because uh, Planet Out has moved away from syndicated content. But you can still see it uh, regularly at the LavenderMagazine.com website, which is Minnesota's largest uh, lesbian gay publication. And oddly enough, um, a South Africa website called GMAX, which has run it religiously since the beginning and has great archives, GMAX co.za but also in uh, two weeks I'll have my own website up joanhilty.com where you can get information and updates about where it's running regularly so um, plug aside it's actually it's something I'd wanted to do for a long time bitter girl started because I was this sounds repetitive given what I contributed but going through a bad breakup and uh, writing angry things in the uh, margins of my diary I hadn't drawn regularly for independent comics for a long time because my day job had been, been taking up a lot of time, but they eventually coalesced into uh, uh, regular characters, um, and they eventually became a strip that I first self-syndicated and then had the good fortune to be picked up uh, by Q Syndicate to do. And, and I enjoy it because, frankly, my, my, my secret uh, long-term... My, my secret fantasy that I have always had is to be a mainstream newspaper comic strip artist. I've always wanted to do it. I actually tried to shop one around after college. I drew a, a strip called Jitterbug Waltz uh, when I was uh, in college. And I love the format. I love the four-panel format. I love, even though it makes me tear my hair out, sort of like condensing everything down to almost sort of a haiku of words of pictures and just like sort of meeting that challenge every week. So that's what it's like. How far ahead do you work? <laughs> the cartoonist question. What sort of pen do you use? Uh, two minutes ahead before deadline. <laughs> I just learned this morning that the script for the comic I want to go up uh, uh, tomorrow night is approved. So that's great. Um, on paper, I'm working six weeks ahead. Uh, realistically, uh, about two, three weeks. <laughs> but so you do that to keep it fresh. To keep, right, exactly. If you guys have questions each to each other, that's fine, too. Um, I don't know how much you time we have. I, 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 that, you, you, that you baited me, but it's true. Because you run the show, we never get to ask you questions. So I'm going to ask... <laughs> 
Um, I, I know that you, you drew on the uh, sort of collective experience of a lot of your Arab dyke friends to, to do Ramadan. What kind of response have you gotten from them and from Arab dykes who you didn't know? Have you gotten much feedback? Um, this, this strip I did for Juicy Mother called Ramadan was really a story that was not my story. It was somebody else's. And I interviewed a whole bunch of Muslim uh, women who were of Arab descent. And um, I'm not I'm not religious at all. I'm not Muslim. And I, I didn't have this life that I'm trying to tell the story of. So it was really hard for me to tell the story and get it correct. So I interviewed all these women. I took their experiences and made a fictional cartoon out of it. Um, the responses have been pretty overwhelming. I mean, very positive from the gay Arab community. People outside of the community have sometimes said, oh, why do you, you know, why do we need more identity politics? Why can't we just all be people, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, for people, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> um, I mean, as if heterosexual white boys aren't identity politics right there. Um, but for, for gay Arab Muslims, I think, you know, it's a chance to see their, their world depicted. So it's a wonderful experience. I'm hoping that it'll be translated into Arabic. And there's a new uh, gay magazine coming out in Beirut. So I think that will get some other kinds of responses, perhaps. <laughs> Do you have more questions, or should I? Well, how about people out there? Okay. Should we yeah. open it up to you guys? The question was what I drew when I was a child. Um, I drew all kinds of stuff. I did a lot of stories with pictures. Some were more like little picture books, and some were like comics. I also did things with my brother and sister. Some were based on Batman and Robin or the Charlie Brown characters, and some were just things out of my own imagination. But I do have a little storybook I made when I was really young, and it's about the character is called Crazy Granny, and she ends up taking off all her clothes and running around and then killing herself. <laughs> I have no memory of drawing this, but... My mother saved it. My mother saved it. And it was in the little box of stuff that I had done. So I still have that, which was really fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, sure. I j you were also talking about other people's early gay comics and innovative work. And I never do this, but I really want to embarrass you, Jen, because I feel like you have also been a total innovator and in um, gay comics, and you were not talking about your early work. Um, I was your editor at Gay Community News in the late 70s. Um, I remember that you you did a weekly strip for us called Cookie Jones, and it was kind of a parody of, um, you know, film noir detectives, um, only with a lesbian detective. And our readers totally flipped out. I mean, people had never seen anything like this. Um, Jennifer went on to draw illustrations for book reviews, just every conceivable thing, covers. Um, every time we ran an image that you had made, um, we got all kinds of comments. Some people loved it. Some people were totally offended. Um, I always felt that it was great. I remember, uh, and I'll tell this on myself, I remember a really early debate with you where you had done a comic strip. It may have even been one of the first ones you did for us that was kind of a parody of the Charles Atlas things where, you know, a guy on a beach kicks sand at somebody. So it's this lesbian version of that. Um, you know, the lesbian gets sand kicked at her. She finally triumphs and wins the girl. She triumphs by eating and getting really, really big because this was an illustration. I remember this. This was an illustration for a book review of fat is a feminist issue. Oh, is that? I didn't and remember so this that. this cartoon illustrated that. I remember that one, yeah. Well, what I do remember is the punchline. Because the punchline was, the big pussy gets the cream. <laughs> Still true today. And I completely flipped out. I thought, I can't run that. 
Jenna, and, but, you, but you did run it. Did I? I thought yeah, it never I, ran. No, it ran. So I give you big points for that. <laughs> I also put you in a cartoon. Remember that one? Oh, I have it at home. <laughs> it's a picture of a, it's an illustration about something about lesbian orgy. That was for a book review that I read. <laughs> And, and Hard this, to remember. This character who's standing there at the lesbian orgy with a name tag that says, Hi, my name is Amy. <laughs> oh, and it says, and the caption was, Your first orgy? <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, I, I'm lane. tempted to tell about the subversive thing you did when you were working at the ad agency, but I realize this is going out over the web. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't she work there anymore. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. Jen, uh, back when there was this uh, amendment that uh, was threatening to go through uh, by referendum in Colorado, uh, actually it did go through. It did go through an anti-gay amendment in Colorado, which fortunately was thrown out later by the Supreme Court. But uh, it was a horrible anti-gay bill. And um, anyway, shortly thereafter, American Express... Uh, ran this advertisement uh, promoting tourism full to Colorado, page, yeah. full page, uh, full page newspaper ad, and they had this design, which was uh, a very ornate border with lots of details uh, that went around the page. And uh, Jen was very offended, and she also worked in the camera department for the uh, agency. And so when the thing hit the paper. Uh, Buried inside all of that ornate stuff were the words gay power. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what cartoonists do for their day job. It's like we get a job at some printing place and we totally destroy the work. There actually, this isn't neat, this isn't rebellious in the slightest, but I keep meaning to tell you guys that there is a issue of the uh, comic book Birds of Prey from DC Comics, which I edit, which uh, stars the superheroines Black Canary and Oracle and Huntress. Three people here will know what I'm talking about. But there's one part where one of them goes to an apartment building and uh, looks at a bunch of names on the buzzer for somebody, and uh, we needed some names on the buzzer. So I know that Wendell Trupstock lives there, and what's that? Wendell Trupstock lives there at the apartment building, uh, Howard's character, and uh, uh, Ethan Green, which is uh, the, from the comic strip, The Absolutely Unfabulous Social Life of Ethan Green. Uh, uh, Lois McIver is one of Alison Bechdel's characters. I came up with a subgirl's crack of some sort for you. I'll have to show you, you any, guys. I didn't, anything from Ivan in there? I can't write... I can't remember. I, I tried you to always look in the, in, the, in the background details of comics because there's always like a mm -hmm. secret message. Any other questions? Comments? Any cartoonists? Can, you, can I get you the mic? <laughs> I have a question for Howard. I just read your book about the man with the rope. And I'm wondering... Um, if you could summarize the story for the people who haven't read it. And um, I was thinking it sounded like Martin Luther King Jr., but I was wondering who, what were you thinking of when you wrote it and what were some of the interpretations that you've heard? Well, you're, you're referring to my book, which is over there on the table, called The Swimmer with a Rope in His Teeth. It's uh, a collaboration, which is unusual for me. The actual story... Uh, was by a friend of mine from Alabama named Jean Schaefer, who is a uh, composer. Uh, she, when I was in college, asked me uh, if I would like to write the libretto for an opera version of that story. Uh, I was a, th in the th a theater major and did a lot of playwriting in those days. And uh, I finally decided I really didn't, uh, you know, I wasn't qualified to write an opera libretto. Uh, uh, so I passed on it, but I thought the story was wonderful. It's a kind of a religious fable, basically about how opportunities are missed, about how the, the opportunities for transcendence are, are missed uh, by human beings. And uh, I just always thought it was a great story. And uh, decades later, or a decade and a half later, I visualized, I suddenly realized, oh, you could tell this story, you know, with illustrations. And so I uh, tracked her down. I was out of touch with her and said, uh, could I do this? I, f I was first thinking as a comic book story, but ultimately I realized it should be a standalone book. And it took a long time to get accomplished, but we finally got it. Uh, I got it finished. And uh, 
I would love it if some of you would take a look at it because it, uh, so far, I think it re received three reviews in the world, and no one's ever heard of it. It's a little labor of love of mine. It's so different from anything else of mine that no one even recognizes it as a Howard Cruz kind of thing. But I think it's got its own special quality, and I would, if you, if you like it, tell your friends because that's the only way anyone will ever know about it. You know, that just when you said nobody would recognize it as your drawings, um, for a while Howard worked drawing the Bazooka Joe bubblegum comics, and I could always tell which ones he drew because of the fingers. Because he draws fingers a really certain way. Would you talk about, like, did you get a script? How did you draw those comics? Well, actually, during, um, during the 80s, Topps Bubblegum, the creative director there, was a fan of underground comics. And he pulled in an, an astonishing array of the standard underground comics people to write and draw uh, various bubblegum cards and features, uh, the most famous being... Uh, uh, Garbage Pail Kids, which was uh, created uh, largely by Art Spiegelman, uh, famous for Mouse. Uh, but there were people like Jay Lynch, and, well, uh, a lot of people whose names may not be familiar, and they were all working anonymously. Uh, but speaking of um, subversive sort of things, that uh, era of tops was full of of that. And, and the um, scripts, I could not write those scripts. I, I I don't do good jokes. I, I'm a character person, and every Bazooka Joe strip has to be written for people as if they have never seen any other Bazooka Joe strip in the world, so you can't have running gags or anything. So I tried a few, but I'm just no good at it. But a lot of uh, people of prominence in the comic book world wrote those gags, and then they would give them to me, and I would draw them, and they're so tiny. I was amazed that anyone could recognize my style. But, of course, if nothing else was a giveaway, my exclamation points were. <laughs> I stole my exclamation points from Al Cap. You, he did these little triangular exclamation points, and so do I. Did you get lots of bubble gum? No. I'll tell you, if you ever went to the top's office, though, you would practically die from the smell of bubble gum. I mean, it is like sugar pollution. It is incredible. Did you get copies, like the printed comic of what you did? They didn't make a big point of doing that. Uh, I, actually, no. No. As a matter of fact, ultimately, ultimately, Art Spiegelman quit in protest because they would never give anybody's artwork back. Uh, for years, they said, oh, we must have it in our files. We may reprint or something. And then there was this news that they were having a big auction for collectors and selling all this artwork for high prices. Of course, none of the money was going to the cartoonists. So anyway, Tops is not high on my list. But there were good people back then. I have a question for Joan. And this was a question that somebody asked me once. Who is Who do you imagine reading your comic? like Bitter Girl or any of your comics? Or do you even imagine a specific audience when you're drawing? Um, it, it's a good question. I have to write for a pretty specific audience because I'm actually not um, enormously talented at creating a wide, wide range of characters. Um, I, I consider our, our, our good friend Alison Bechdel to be one of the best practitioners of that form in terms of creating an ensemble of people who are in all sorts of different relationships. In fact, every time I come up with three time, three out of four times I come up with an idea for a new character, I have to remind myself that Allison has already done it, which drives me crazy, but she has. Um, I definitely imagine uh, uh, somebody, basically a, a 30-something, 40-something dyke, um, who is urban? Because uh, there, there's no getting around the fact that I grew up in the suburbs and then went to uh, stuck to as many cities as possible. But I imagine somebody who is about my age, who is urban, and who has an interest in you know politics as it intertwines with inevitably your your queer life. It have you found that's really your audience, or did you get responses from other people? I'm actually just starting to figure out, this is one of the reasons I'm finally putting up a website. I would actually really like to get more information about who reads me. I'm starting to put together the mechanisms for, for getting a collection together, because frankly, I've been out of the loop for a while. I've drawn Bitter Girls since about late 2001, but I've drawn it in isolation, and it's and because I haven't had a site, I get, I get fan mail, but it's hard to know where it's coming from, so I'm really looking forward to that becoming a little clearer in this next year. 
So any other questions from anybody? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's the recording. You know, growing up queer in the 70s and 80s when I was a teenager, um, I don't know what happened to my Pudge comics. I'm really kind of bummed, but I think I probably tattered them to death. Um, but queer comics were a huge lifeline for me, and I'm under the impression that if I were 15 today and looking for queer comics, I'd find fewer than I did. I, I think time. a lot of it's on the Internet now. Like, if you're a young cartoonist starting out and you can't get published, instead of making your own little zines... Now, a lot of people are just making a website. So if you surf the web, you find a lot of, um, like, I don't know, there's, there's stuff out on the Internet. I mean, people are still doing zines, you know, handmade little books, but um, I think the Internet is kind of where you're going to find a lot of that. I think it's really shifted there. You think that there's still a huge queer comic scene. Well, for one thing, there's not a huge comic scene. There's <laughs> been a big contraction of comics in general, Uh I mean, I think I think that's true to some extent in the mainstream. It's certainly true in alternative uh, comics. It's very hard to, uh, you know, pay for the time it takes to draw comics, which is very labor intensive. And so there's not a lot of money to be made. So it tends to be something that is undertaken by young people who are still at an age that they haven't accumulated a lot of debt and they don't have a mortgage and stuff like that. Um, and many of those people are just very hip to the Internet. I think uh, uh, Jen is absolutely right. The comics on the web scene is just astonishingly vital and creative. Uh, I just became have become aware of it. I'm constantly discovering. I don't have a lot of time to read it, but occasionally things take me to these different sites of cartoonists I've never heard of. And it's totally free editorially. That's what's wonderful. I mean, of course, that means there's a lot of crap out there, but uh, it also means that there's nobody telling people they can't do what their heart tells them to do. So I think that that's, that's the kind of lifeline. I don't think print is where it's at nearly as much now. Uh, and for one thing, you know, we were trying to break through the total silence, and there's a lot of things that have broken through the silence about the existence of gay people now. But I will say that I really prefer to read comics, you know, in, in hard copy. Than I, I don't like to read comics on the Internet. I do, but there's something about having a book. So Juicy Mother will always be a book. Um, also, I want to just say that Howard has a fabulous website. I mean, not only just about comics, but he also gives all his little insider tips on for cartoonists, uh, tricks on how to do things, because we all share our little tricks, so it's good that way and Joan's website will be coming up and I have a website too so I, oops, sorry. go ahead I do just just one more thing I'm sorry but but I I, I agree with you know bo both you guys that that the web scene is 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 vital in a, in a way that it's never been but I hope that it doesn't completely displace print because it's true there was in the case of queer comics, um, you know, gay comics came along because Howard looked around and said, you know, there's 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 a small community of stuff for me to read, but there's got to be something more complex than than Meat Men out there. And I think that, you know, gay comics publishing regularly for quite a while as it did was really kind of a mainstay um, for various reasons. It started publishing less frequently, and you did have a gap for a while that was filled by the zine seen and now I this is why I'm particularly excited about Juicy Mother it's kind of come along and said and looked at everything that's come before and said that was great but how can we expand the definition even more like Howard started it by expanding the definition with gay comics and and you know Jen has has expanded it further because like you know you, there need to be comics about the you know there need to be comics about communities of color of you know of of uh, various you know on various gender issues right exactly transgender issues um we are going to do a, a second anthology i i hope I, she's, signing the contract. <laughs> she's signing the contract and and i've committed to it and i think it's a really exciting way to sort of keep stuff alive and keep the sort of evolving definition of the queer community in print sorry go ahead I have two short questions. One is in your early days, you used to have postcards for Jen that you would sell, and I'm wondering if you still are doing that because they were great postcards oh, that could be found. I think I might have brought some. I'm not sure. I've, I'll check. I think I have some. And my other question is, who do you think your audience is and who's reading your stuff? 
my audience is me. I draw these really for myself, and and I don't have you know. I just send it out there, and I don't really know who reads it. And I don't when I'm drawing, I don't really think about an audience so much. Um, but I hope there's like some little young dyke out there who's just really inspired to, you know, do whatever she's gonna do. But I really draw it and write it for myself. It's it's always because I want to see that story out there. Any other questions? Comments? Anybody have any jokes? <laughs> yeah. How do you think that your comics fit in politically, if at all? I mean, do you think that, do you see your comics as a mechanism for change in any way, or do you, is it more of entertaining and informing at the same time, but not? It's all about making Winona Judd come out as a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> You said it, not me. Just make sure that shows on the transcript. <laughs> Howard, do you want to give? Well, you know, I have, I have, I suffer for lack of a platform. It's not. Uh, I would love to do stuff, more stuff that's directly political and connected to. Um, you know, current events, and I have strong feelings about things. I the day is past when I feel all consumed by gay issues. Uh, Right now, my biggest concerns politically are things other than the gay movement, uh, you know, like protecting civil liberties and stuff like that. So I, I'm not really moved to try for platforms in gay publications that will expect me to do nothing but gay stuff. Doing my graphic novel, Stuck or a Baby, gave me a chance to do something about racism, which coming from Alabama during the 60s, it was a, a very uh, important, pivotal time in my life, and Wendell did not really present a good opportunity to do something that was as nuanced as I wanted to do on the topic. And so uh, right now there's really uh, not a lot of publications that are open to comics. I mean, The Advocate doesn't run comics anymore, and a lot of other publications don't. So, uh, And when they do, they go get you know, a small set of regular, you know, you know, people, prestige people like Art Spiegelman or something. So um, it's kind of hard to break through. I think comics can really speak to important issues. And, uh, you know, I think all of us who are cartoonists are always in search of a way, a place we can do them where we can actually be free to do them our way rather than be put into a mold. I, I And I think, you know, putting aside the question of, how hard it is to reach a wider audience because it is difficult. It's always going to be difficult. My answer to that question would be that I, I actually like and, and take comfort in sort of, you know, having a political voice within an entertainment medium, you know, medium, uh, you know, in the early days of, of the gay movement, I think we learned from very early on that, that, you know, street theater and sort of the, the, the uh, coded language you could send out through various forms of entertainment was one way to get your views um, out there. And I do think that, that I do like that, that telling comic stories, sequential comic stories, week to week, month to month, you know, several pages, is a great way to sort of, you know, get people into the lives of even fictional gay people in a way that is more deep and impactful than watching a couple episodes of Will and Grace. So I enjoy doing it from that perspective. I just want to add that comics are, like, people come to comics really open. They think they're going to be really cheap and easy and fun and like, oh, it's candy. So you can just, like, you can hit them over the head. Real, you can catch them and smack them. And that's what I like about comics. Um, and it, there's a there's something strange about the way the United States deals with comics because in this country, everybody thinks comics is a children's medium. And it, that's not true in Europe, South America, Asia. That's... In, the, in other countries, it's accepted as an adult art form, and graphic novels are in every bookstore, and, you know, nobody's shocked that you see naughty things in cartoons. Um, this country is slowly, slowly, slowly catching on that adults read comics. So I think comics are a really good way to get a message across, um, and... Unfortunately, you just can't make any money doing it. <laughs> yeah. 
I have I the mic. She has the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I have the mic, so I'm taking it. The um, person with I, the phallic symbol wins. I'm just, right? Only in America. No, I um, just wanted to make a comment about how documentary comics are and have been for me in my life and how important it is to me as a, you know, a gay person to have this kind of documentation of gay reality in pictorial format. Um, you know, I've grown up reading the Sunday funnies and I even save some of them. And you could take like even an example of like Doonesbury as like a real commentary and a real documentary of a point of view in, a, in, in the country and the world sometimes. So I think it's really cool when we have the gay perspective and um, I'm really interested in anthologies of of gay cartoonists work and other queer con art artists work and so I was just wondering besides the web and like the teeny weeny bookstores I mean do you really think that there is a forum for that you know there's always another queer cartoonist coming up saying oh I'm gonna make comics you know so even though all the odds are against us people are still gonna make comics I want to just mention there's a, a website called prism I think it's prism.com, prisoncomics.org. Thank you. Which is an umbrella group for gay cartoonists, gay and lesbian tranny cartoonists. And they have lists of creators. If you're looking for other gay cartoonists, if you're editors or whatever, or just fans, um, I think people will always be doing comics, even though it's really labor intensive. You know, you spend hours doing a panel that someone reads in two seconds. And whether it's on the web or in books, I think, you know, it'll it'll still always be out there. I mean, there is a real fundamental problem, though, in terms of people, uh, cartoonists reaching their potential uh, when uh, it's very difficult to support yourself during the time it takes to do a long work in comics. And, I, you know, this is essentially rules out... Uh, a life comparable to a normal novelist who writes a novel and then writes another novel and then writes another novel. I mean, I'm still recovering economically uh, from Stuck Rubber Baby, and that was that came out over 10 years ago. Uh, it uh, was a great experience, but uh, it's, it uh, ties you down uh, when you have you know the normal everyday issues. The so the reason I mention this is that. There's been a breakthrough in intellectual circles. I think more and more people who write and sort of opinion makers will say now that their uh, serious comics for adults is a viable literature uh, medium, literary medium. But it isn't a mass medium. Graphic novels are not yet a mass medium. Uh, for some reason, comics from Japan <laughs> have come in like gangbusters, and I don't mean to disparage them by saying for some reason, uh, they, they're they called manga and bookstores are full of them. And the, 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 there's a huge backlog of stuff that they've been publishing in Japan forever that are just now being translated, and so they can be sold very inexpensively. Um, this shows that there's a potential mass audience for comics, but uh, it's a very niche audience for those kinds of comics. And for the general person who wants to do serious literature in comics forum about real issues of life, um, no one pays the kind of advances that will allow someone to work for several years on a book. And uh, so everyone has to have a day job, and it's a fractured life, and it's And I just want to add that, to that most of the um, more well-known cartoonists mostly heterosexual white boys were supported by their wives for their first five to ten years until they got known. So really what you need is a, a well-paid wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just want to ask if either of the three of you have ever fantasized about drawing a cover for the New Yorker or a New Yorker cartoon since that's probably the biggest adult comic outlet in this country. I'd do it. Yeah, sure. What would you put on the cover? It would depend what season it was in, because you kind of have to be seasonal, I think. So I'd like to do a Halloween cover. A Halloween cover? I don't know. It's all kind of uh, New York uh, 
are directing politics involved at the New Yorker, uh, I know they're not going to come asking me to do a cover. They don't like my drawing style. That's it. What he's talking about is Art Spiegelman's wife is the is the art director at the New Yorker. You got a perfect example there of, of what Jen just cited. I would do something something pulpy with uh, a woman with, with, with big hair, like a cowgirl, probably a cowgirl cover. And you know, it, it's when you when you put it that way, my my heart sort of sank. But but it's true. It is one of the the periodicals with the the, the, the most mainstream periodicals with the most, albeit mostly single panel cartoons in in the U.S. And and unfortunately, they are they are pretty slow. They 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 they've gone through an evolution where they went from being a very text heavy magazine to introducing color and and under I guess I don't know who to credit Tina Brown, alternative cartoonists uh, certainly with the influence of. Uh, Spiegelman, and I'm going to mess up her name, Francois Mouly, uh, bringing in like the Hernandez brothers and uh, uh, Charles Burns and Adrian Tomin, Harvey Kikar, but still sort of a like straight white guy clique. And it's also true of, say, when they do a women's issue of the New Yorker. Some of you may know that I believe there were, what was it? It, it? It's it's always sort of that thing where, well, it's great they did a women's issue, but most of the articles and all of the cartoons are by men. So, you know what, Joe? Way to go. You can do that, um, cowgirl, on the cover for Juicy Mother. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming on such a beautiful day. And um, I guess we're going to be signing books and um, signing body parts and underwear and drawing tattoos on anybody who wants one. <laughs> And do come to our website. Thank you so much.